Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna, and that is Kelly. Hey. Before we get started, we wanted to remind you to check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you haven't followed that, go ahead and click the links in the description. And if you haven't left an... Finding the right pros for home projects can be tough and spark a lot of questions like, how do I find a pro who can help? Will they do a good job? Will I get a fair price? That's where HomeAdvisor can help. From leaky faucets to major remodels, HomeAdvisor connects you to the right pro for the job in seconds and even helps you get a fair price. Read reviews, check project cost guides, and book appointments. Go to HomeAdvisor.com or download the free HomeAdvisor app to start your next project. iTunes review, we would appreciate those too. We read those at the end of the show, so if you left one, definitely listen at the end, and we will say thank you. And cry. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> In the description for this episode, you will find links to the research material that I use for this episode, as well as resources for victims. There will be links to domestic violence resources, child protective services, suicide hotlines, mental health resources, etc. will be in the description. Cool? Cool. And then the last thing before we get started is there's also going to be a link to our Patreon. And we have a few more people on Patreon that we want to shout out this week. What? So we wanted to say thank you to Layla, Kim, and Darby for their support on Patreon. Thanks so much, you Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. And I think that's pretty much it. We can get started. Cool. So you want to kick off story time? Yes, I would love to. <laughs> All right. So Kimberly Hill lived in Corpus Christi, Texas, with her two teenage children. Kim was a 50-year-old hospice caregiver and, by all accounts, a very kind and loving mother. Her daughter Desiree Hill had inherited her mother's pleasant disposition and kind-hearted nature, but her 18-year-old son, Kevin Davis, seemed to be the opposite of his mother and sister. Kevin struggled with depression and dark thoughts with some behavioral outbursts. Kevin would later admit that he was prone to having violent fantasies, with some of them even about his mother and sister. Dude, no. No? <laughs> yeah. Dude, uh-uh. Knock it off. By 2014, Kevin was frequently talking about his depression and suicidal thoughts. I would think that's a good thing for most people. Like, talk about it. Get it out. You know? And then rat- but I don't think it helped. <laughs> no, rat that person out. Are you supposed no, to be like, no. hey, Kevin's getting really, really fucking weird. Well, this if he's talking about his depression and suicidal thoughts, then maybe he would get help, you know? Yeah, I mean, it would help him to process it. He's talking to the wrong people, probably. Someone's like, yeah, that's nice. It's like, hey, bro, shut up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't want to hear don't about your Don't be a pussy. Feelings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to talk to the right people. Yeah. <laughs> We'd be like, oh, Kevin. <laughs> you got to say no homo after <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> I have depression and thinking about killing myself. I'm real sad, guys. No, <laughs> no homo. homo. <laughs> <laughs> then maybe his bros would have taken it more seriously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lesson learned. Um, his mother was heartbroken and would try to be loving and supportive of her son. Kim would remind Kevin that he was just a teenager with his whole life ahead of him. Since Kim worked hospice, she dealt with people fighting for their lives, and she had trouble fully understanding why Kevin did not want to live. I mean, I would feel like if I worked in hospice, I would understand more than anyone why people would want to die. Yeah. Because that's a crazy job. I could never do that. No. That's so depressing. Yeah, and it smells weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's all that piss smell just makes me want to die. Uh. <laughs> no, but I mean, I don't know. I understand. It's her son and he's so young and whatnot. But if I'm a hospice worker, mm-mm. You know, she's probably just dumb by the end of the day. She just gets yeah. home and she's like, don't fucking talk to me, Kevin. I smell like old cheese. Martha puked on my leg. Johnny died. Okay. Oh, school was hard. <laughs> Tell me more about math I class. smell like geriatric sponge bath. <laughs> ah. uh-huh. When he had particularly low moods, she tried to talk him out of it to the best of her ability. It is unknown if Kevin ever spoke with a therapist or received treatment from a psychiatrist. Yeah, I could not find any information on him seeing a counselor or anybody at any point. And it seems like it was an issue for most of his life that he struggled with his mental health, but Mm -hmm. didn't seem like he saw anybody. Yeah. In March 2014, Kevin came to his mother, Kim, proclaiming that his life was over. 
Kevin told his mother that he was bored with living and said he was, quote, weary with life and hated other people. You know when someone uses the word weary, they're serious. Yeah, serious. <laughs> I'm so weary, Mom. <laughs> you're a teenager. Stop talking like you're 82. <laughs> I'm going to stop working at the hospice place. This is your right. You're picking up weird words. <laughs> then Kevin asked for permission to kill himself. Kim was very upset but had no idea what to do. What do you mean to no idea what to do? Now call someone. Just I know. I know. It's always easier in hindsight. And Yeah. But <sighs> it's weird that she reacted the way she did and just kind of shut down, especially mm-hmm. as someone who's in the healthcare field. Yeah. I feel like she would have gotten her son more help. But also maybe there's this kind of panic that sets in when it's your kid. Yeah. It's so different and you're so invested that you just are at a loss of what to do. Yeah. I don't know. But I'm just kind of giving her the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to tie my kid to the bed and then I'm going to cover everything in bubble wrap for <laughs> hours. <laughs> just... You're suicide proof. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that worked for my depression. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll have like my kid like build it with me so then by the end they'll know that their life has purpose and meaning and <laughs> And they won't want to kill themselves. Anymore. I just gave you value and <laughs> made you mental illness proof. <laughs> oh, you gotta love that bubble wrap. <laughs> Solving problems. She was probably not sure how to answer her son's question. Then she decided to tell Kevin that she was sad to hear that he felt that way, but she couldn't control him or make decisions for him. I don't exactly know what she was getting at with that response. She just said, word up. (laughs) She's like, you do you. (laughs) What kind of response is that? Like, what? (laughs) I can't stop you. Yeah. That's a little strange to me. I just don't get it. Yeah, not from a mom. Like, I can understand, like, another teenager that's kind of depressed, doing their own involved with other stuff. But she's the mom. She's supposed to be able to help with situations like this. Yeah, it just seems like she would have a better grasp on what to do for her son. I can totally understand another teenager, someone that's really young. But not the mom. How about you just say, hey, don't do that? Not like, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry. You're grounded. Yeah. (laughs) yeah I don't know it's just confusing to me you want to get ice cream or something like I don't know what you would tell your kids <laughs> sounds like it's time for a 31 flavors run yeah exactly you feeling some Ben and Jerry's who needs some chocolate chip cookie dough <laughs> you want a waffle cone <laughs> somebody needs some sprinkles <laughs> exactly they're exactly like Prozac <laughs> fuck that I'd rather have 31 flavors than Prozac any day <laughs> This answer upset Kevin, and he decided to act out the ideas he had been fantasizing about for quite a while. So I'm pretty sure that no matter what she said... He was gonna... Yeah. (laughs) He would have lost it. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's something that tells me that he was just planning and plotting and kind of heading in this direction the whole time. I don't know. Unless he went to 31 Flavors, then shit... It could have stopped it. (laughs) Could have been different. Uh, Name one time chocolate chip cookie dough and fix everything. (laughs) I'll wait. (laughs) First, he grabbed a cord from his video game console came up behind his mother as she sat on the couch watching TV, then used the cord to choke her. Kim was fighting hard, and apparently Kevin felt this was taking too much energy or effort, so he went into his mother's bedroom and retrieved a hammer. As Kevin opened the bottom drawer of his mother's dresser to get the hammer, he could hear Kim hysterically screaming. So, why is there a hammer in the bedroom? Okay, proceed. (laughs) (laughs) For nasty times. <laughs> I role play as a construction worker. Right? Check carpenter. out this tool belt. Yeah. <laughs> you like my flannel? <laughs> Cause sexy home improvement. <laughs> he could hear her hysterically screaming, which agitated him further. Kevin returned to the living room and hit his mother in the head with the hammer 20 times. Kevin then wanted to make sure his mother was dead, so he reached into the opening in her skull and mixed up her brains. After there was no response, he grabbed a knife and again stirred it around inside her skull. He would later say that the consistency felt like putty and admitted to tasting it as well. When Kevin was sure she was dead, he sexually assaulted Kim's corpse. Ew. That's really crazy. Like, I feel like there's way more building up to that, um... Like, instead of him just wanting to kill himself. Like, I know he had violent fantasies, but, like, nothing to ever... That's why I'm saying I think no matter what 
she said that night, yeah. he was kind of on a path or on a mission to this is what he was going to do. He was just kind of creating a scenario where he could be upset with her. That's what I think. Who the fuck mixes up some brains? I just. This guy. Ugh. Yeah. He's real nasty. Ugh. It's not ambrosia. You don't just like. Ugh. I don't. <laughs> Ugh. And then he had sex with it. Like after the head was mm-hmm. all. Blue. Okay. Yeah. And I don't remember seeing information about him covering up her head either. Because there's a lot of necrophiliacs that will kill someone and then basically cover up where the wound is. Then there's other ones that will actually enjoy the site of the murder, like the actual wound that killed the person. Yeah, like and it seems like wound. he was into that. He was into the wound. Yeah. Who, Kevin? Are you hungry? I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> it's about dinner time. <laughs> Kevin Davis then waited for his sister to return home so he could repeat the previous attack. While he was waiting for his sister, Desiree, he used Kim's blood to write messages on the wall of their apartment, including Chase Me, Sorry for the Mess, and his initials KD. Why are you going to apologize now? (laughs) Sorry for the mess. Jesus. (laughs) It's not like it's a house party. You killed a person. (laughs) Desiree did not show up for a while, so Kevin decided to leave. He left Kim's body naked from the waist down and posed in a sexual nature. He got on his bike and rode along the railroad tracks. After riding for a while, he threw his backpack and bike in some brush, then walked up to the first house he saw. Kevin knocked on the door and requested that the couple call the police because he had just killed somebody. That is terrifying. A murderer just walks up and knocks on your door. What the fuck? Hey, I just killed someone. Can knock, you call knock. the cops? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right? We don't want any. <laughs> Take your Girl Scout cookies next door. Yeah, I, I really don't know how you would handle that situation. I know. Like, yeah. I would just shut the door in their face and call the cops. Yeah, let me get my gun real quick or something. I don't, yeah, call the cops. Because you don't know the situation of what happened. You can only, or I would only assume the worst, mm-hmm. you know? And it's a kid, so that's super scary too. Yeah. Hmm. When detectives interrogated Kevin, he immediately confessed to killing and sexually assaulting his mother. When officers asked if it was his first time having sex, Kevin said, yes, I guess I lost my virginity to a dead corpse. And also your Your mother, dude. And your mom. (laughs) (laughs) Dumb. Um, How lucky are you to be his sister? Like, like, imagine she just stayed after, like, oh, I I got caught up talking. That was the best study session ever. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Whatever it was that kept her, damn. I hope she was smoking weed. (laughs) Her mind would have been blown. Weed saving lives. Yeah. (laughs) Like, no way. Just that one last joint. Yeah. (laughs) Kevin admitted to fantasizing and planning the murder of his mother and sister long before the attack. He also admitted to still having a fantasy about dressing in a suit, decapitating a girl, then putting her in in a nice dress before having sex with her corpse, calling it a night to remember. I hate him so much. (laughs) He's awful. (laughs) Kevin was very open about the fact that if he had the opportunity to kill another person, he would do it again. The investigator asked what his mother did to deserve this, and Kevin said, Absolutely nothing. I'm just a terrible, disgusting person. I don't have standards. I don't have morals. A body's a body. A piece of meat. Fuck this guy. This is me after sex. (laughs) (laughs) Detectives were concerned that he may be mentally ill or insane, but Kevin insisted that he was sane, not mentally ill, and knew what he did. When the detectives asked if Kevin regretted killing his mother, he answered, In a way, yes, but I wouldn't take back what I did. I did love her in a way. In a nasty kind of way. Right. (laughs) (laughs) The wrong kind of way. (laughs) Please don't love your mom like that, bro. Please. Loved all over her face and her back. (laughs) (laughs) You left a lot of love all over. (laughs) Yeah. Mom, let me wipe that love off your face real quick. (laughs) Sorry. Okay, I'm good. Okay. Uh, oh, wrap it up don't leave your love everywhere dude yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think he has to be insane right because you would think so but he, he mixed up the brains yeah that's and what then, you would think but that's not what legally happens he did like wait, when you know when you're, taste test? when you're baking cookies and you lick the spoon <laughs> a little bit of the batter yeah he just licks <laughs> some of the uh. 
Medical experts determined that Kevin was fit to stand trial and had no mental or psychotic issues, although his behavior throughout the trial was odd. Kevin pled guilty to the murder and turned down a 60-year plea deal from the prosecution team. During the trial, the prosecution played Kevin's taped confession from the night of the murder. Jurors cringed and covered their faces when the video showed Kevin telling detectives that he had once choked and drowned a cat, then performed a sexual act with its remains. That's not a fleshlight. No. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. everyone's so testy about animals. I know. You didn't have that reaction when he killed his mom. <laughs> you were grossed out, but not sad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. I think that's interesting. Sorry. Just, just he, on a personal No, level. you're right. Yeah, I don't know. I guess uh, animals are innocent to me. I guess the mom's innocent too, so I, my reasoning is stupid right now. But No, not at all. It's just the way that someone's brain works, and most people yeah. feel that way. The cat had no control over whether Kevin got therapy or not, so I mean, I know. that's unfair. I know, and it probably just walked up and was like yeah, rubbing its butt on it. Being him. slutty, yeah, arching <laughs> its back. She was asking for Bacon it. Bacon biscuits, you know, in Katie's little yeah. butthole. Up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love kitty buttholes. It, pff, they're just <laughs> <laughs> that's when kitties fart. They go because <laughs> they have no butt cheeks. You know. <laughs> I do. I do know. <laughs> You're looking at me like you do know because you you kitty fart all the time. <laughs> do you? I just think it's funny. Dogs do the same thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Except for their buttholes are less exposed. Usually, there's like yeah a bit more on there. Yeah, that's true. Poor cats, they're just so naked. Just clean, just clean just... buttholes. Dogs, not so much. Yeah. Okay, back to the story. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, buttholes come up a lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> we are the butthole podcast. <laughs> okay. Kevin watched the video intently, and when it was over, he swiveled his chair to face the jury and smiled. He's such a creep throughout yeah. this whole thing. Ugh. I hope the jurors were all cat people. Like, just, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's disgusting. just wearing kitty sweaters in the jury box. <laughs> just holding up like little bub hats. <laughs> <laughs> the prosecution called the 911 callers from the home where Kevin knocked on the door wanting to report the murder. As the witnesses took the stand, Kevin creepily waved to them. The defense called no witnesses during the trial, and when Kevin's lawyer appealed for a lighter sentence due to mental issues, the prosecution reiterated that no medical evidence of any mental or emotional illness had been found. Prosecutors tried to drive home the point that not only had Kevin committed this murder while medically sane, but he also admitted that if given the chance, he would probably kill again. Yeah, that's a fucking important legal factor. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you want to do it again? All right. Let's add a few years on there. He's up for parole in 10, so (laughs) maybe he'll be better then. Both legal teams rested after only a one-day trial, and Kevin Davis was found guilty after less than an hour of juror deliberation. At sentencing, Kevin went against his lawyer's request for a lighter sentence and announced that he deserved 100 years, saying, I'm not mentally disturbed. I'm sane. I know what I did. At least that's his stance, is he knows he fucked up. Yeah. And he's like, you have to keep me off the streets or I'm going to kill somebody. Yeah. At, at least he's not like, oh, I'm innocent or making yeah. up some sort of story or an excuse. You or he know? found Jesus and now he's over it. Right. Yeah. I just needed to get that one kill out. Now yeah. I'm good. <laughs> Kevin's father, Clyde, said, it's all uncalled for. He didn't have to do that. Kevin's sister, Desiree, told him, you took the only person who had your back. Now you are all alone. Davis was subsequently sentenced to life in prison. Where was his dad? I like how his dad added his two sons. At the last minute. Yeah. I got something to say. (laughs) Fuck you, dad. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if they were separated. I never found that information. But it seemed Uh -uh. like the dad wasn't at the house. Like the children and Kim, the mother, was just living at an apartment and the dad wasn't involved. The sister said the the mom was the only person who had his back. So I'm assuming... They didn't have a good relationship, so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, so that was awful. Yeah, he didn't really have a lot of remorse, but at the same time, at least he wasn't making excuses. Yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to give a murderer credit, but it always feels shittier when they're like, I didn't do it. Yeah. I'm innocent, or it's their fault. Like, 
how did oh man how do you tell someone's sane because i think i think he's totally not sane exactly <laughs> like, that always threw me off on this story you fucked a corpse you jiggled up some brains you're not sane nope. I, even if you take credit for your action doesn't mean you're sane i feel like that's completely different right having a handle on the reality of the situation doesn't mean you're mentally well yeah just because you know what happened yeah and you could state the facts doesn't mean that your mental health is not a factor here mm-hmm. you know Plus, he looks kind of like a weasel-faced rat or something. That's not good. Is it the teeth or the nose? <laughs> There's something about, yeah, he's just, yeah, he's just got a, a rat face. Is he constantly eating cheese? <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be that. I don't want to, like, dwell on someone's appearance, but when they're a murderer, I'm just going to talk shit Oh, about yeah, we them. could talk mad yeah. shit. Yeah, I would never do you that to a normal. Someone, fuck it. Yeah. Yeah. Just a regular. Total one. rat face. Yeah. Like, teeth marks when he domes you up. Like. Oh. <laughs> Aww. Yeah, bad, bad face. So anyway, that's a great necrophilia story. I like necrophilia. It combines so many things. Yeah. Matricide, necrophilia, mm-hmm. incest it had to be included. Yeah. It was good. Good story. Does incest change if the person is dead? It's still, in- I mean. No, it's still incest. Yeah. They I don't mean, become not stupid. your sister when they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> they don't die. You don't get emancipated as soon as your dick goes in. I just thought maybe there was another term for it. You know? I've been waiting Next- for this moment my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I didn't know if it was like a hybrid word or something yeah. that existed. Yeah. Incest and necrophilia together. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know. <laughs> All right. You ready for the next story? Ready. I got one for you. Whew. Hit me. Andre Rigo was born on December 17, 1955, in Czechoslovakia. Not much is known about his childhood, but Andre would say, My parents were good, they didn't beat me. It's a good gold standard for parenthood. <laughs> <laughs> I think I read that in Parenthood magazine. <laughs> they didn't beat me, yeah. Good. Rule number one of parenting. Andre does recall that he did like his parents. He was not as bright as his peers, and in adulthood would be reported to have a low IQ. He was a quiet child, and throughout his life, people would say that he seldom talked. His father was a criminal, and after being arrested, Andre was sent away to an orphanage with his siblings. His father would later be killed while attempting to rob a house, and his mother passed away after being struck by a car. Wow, that's... I know. Shitty. Yep. Good way to make a necrophiliac. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the ones that we talked about, I feel like both their parents died while they were young. Wasn't that common? Like, who was it? Earl Nelson? Or I feel like it's kind of a theme. No parents. No yeah. rules. <laughs> <laughs> Party. <laughs> Military service was compulsory in Czechoslovakia, so Andre joined the army. During his military service, he met and married a woman. But when he returned home from his time in the military, his new wife started getting very jealous. Isn't that the opposite? You would think that long distance is harder, and then when someone comes home... Well, I guess if he's in the military and it's mostly men, maybe she wasn't True, yeah. She's like, who are you going to fuck? Right? I mean, a hole's a hole. Yeah, actually (laughs) true. You know? Jail and military. Same what thing. a fucking... God, keep talking hot. Hot, <laughs> hot, 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 God, community showers. I know, right? <laughs> a lot of rope snapping. <laughs> and anal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and just bubbles going down so someone's foam. back. You know? <laughs> Tramp stamp tattoos. Right? I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> This began to cause a lot of tension in their marriage, and eventually they split up. Andre was married a second time, but little is known about his second wife. Usually it's the opposite, like the starter wife nobody knows about. Yeah. Then they divorce, and then there's this just the crazy, hot young, crazy. the hot young crazy <laughs> one, exactly. He took up the trade of being a gas man and began working with heating systems. Gas man. <laughs> and it sounds like a flatulent superhero. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of a Dumb and Dumber. He's like, the, the gas man. He's like, how does he know I got gas? <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> I think we were at just the right age to just get that awful, yeah. awful humor. <laughs> so good. <laughs> it was perfect for us. 
He was employed by a local newspaper, then two hospitals, eventually ending up working at the Hotel Carlton in their heater room. He's a regular old jack of all trades. <laughs> he just Jesus. kept moving to one place to the next, yeah. you know. Andre had been arrested 11 times before he progressed to murder. Like his father before him, Andre also supported himself through burglarizing homes. In 1989, he was also arrested for forging a passport, then attempting to flee Slovakia to Germany and Austria. He was captured and sentenced to a prison time for the forged passport and attempts to flee the country. Once he served his time for fleeing with fake documents, he used a fake passport again. This time, he actually made it to Vienna and obtained yet another fake passport, then to Munich to meet up with his brother. Awesome. I don't know enough <laughs> about what's going on in this area at the time, but it was a big deal to flee the country. He sought like refugee status yeah. and then he ended up in a camp and then he fled the camp, but we're more interested in the murder. So I was just kind of making a summary of yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Still cool. <laughs> There's I th a lot more to it than that, you know, he, like two or three sentences. Yeah, he got away with two fake passports. That's right? Bravo. Jesus. Yeah. You would think that that would be harder, but I think back in the day... Now there's just way too much with the computer system. Yeah, you just, you'll never. No. But he handmade his own shit. Probably. Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> Out of Kinko's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the mid-90s, he arrived in a new city, fresh out of jail, unable to speak the language, with very little money or resources. So Andre turned back to burglary as a means to support himself. It is believed that his first murder was the result of a home invasion gone wrong. Andre always crept into houses in the middle of the night, armed with whatever heavy object he could easily find outside. So, uh, creep. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you and I need to, like, cosplay TLC and reenact that entire music yeah. video. <laughs> I'll have those long strips of hair in the oh, front. Yes. I'm going to be T-Boss. Yes. <laughs> Late in the evening on June 7th, 1990, he snuck through a partially open window of the ground floor bedroom of a 40-year-old woman named Helena. When he broke into Helena's home, she must have woken up, which led Andre to hit her with a metal pipe he had brought into the house. He became aroused in the process of killing her, so he covered the top half of her body with a blanket and had sex with her. In his very first murder, Andre did not steal anything from the house. He most likely rushed out of the house after realizing what he had done, which also points to the crime being unplanned. As he left, he threw the pipe on the ground outside the house. Basically, he's an accidental necrophiliac. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think that he stumbled across this because his career was breaking and entering, pretty much. Or maybe he would have discovered it no matter what. But because he had been breaking into houses and he kind of accidentally... Killed someone? Yeah. He didn't accidentally stick it in her, though. <laughs> he there wasn't... He, he could have just Okay, ran. I retract my previous <laughs> statement. <laughs> he could have just been like, oh my god, what did that do? But he covered her top half. Yeah. And then was like, well, what happens if I... You're right. I'm very tired <laughs> and wrong. <laughs> On August 1st, 1990, he broke into the home of 28-year-old Ilka Z and kills her with an iron rod. I forgot to mention that the victims, they don't have last names provided. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them are first names and last initials. Okay. So... Don't think that I'm just like not representing the victim. That's mm -hmm. actually the information that's out there has yeah. their last initial. Okay. Anyway. What did, what did he kill the last one with? An iron rod. And when we're dealing with necrophilia, I feel like that's inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> Death by rod. <laughs> <laughs> no. Sorry. <laughs> just... After death by rod. <laughs> First I murdered you, and then I'm going to murder your pussy. <laughs> In I that can't. order. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I feel bad. I can't even laugh at that. I did. I know. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> After she succumbed to her injuries, he stabs a screwdriver into her neck, 
then has sex with her body. He then covers her, rummages through the house, stealing jewelry and money before fleeing the scene. So the first one, he wasn't comfortable enough to actually burglarize the house. Yeah. yeah. This time he burglarized and he stuck a screwdriver in it. Right? Escalate much? Mm-hmm. The murder weapon is left inside the victim's home along with a men's sock. Like Cinderella? <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Exactly like he's the Cinderella of murderers. He had to be home by 12. (laughs) Before his carriage turned into a pumpkin. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, man. German police suspect that the murderer used a sock instead of a glove to prevent leaving fingerprints at the scene. That hunch ends up being right and becomes an important clue in the investigation. I thought he just like sock puppets or something. <laughs> Did the sock have googly eyes? <laughs> <laughs> we're like, we're looking for a suspect who has the worst smelling feed. We just, <laughs> we, it's, we know one thing. Possibly. <laughs> After two crimes in the area that were extremely similar, the police determined it is the work of the same man. They found another sock though, huh? <laughs> Sorry. Just stupid. a trail of socks. <laughs> Andre would continue this spree in a series of murders that would be almost identical. Andre's MO would include the sock gloves every crime, as well as the use of a heavy weapon that would be easily available on his way to commit a crime. The detectives would find cigarette butts left outside where Andre must have smoked and watched the house before breaking in. All of the victims would be sexually assaulted post-mortem, with some of the women even also being mutilated. So much DNA left around. I, I know. wish CODIS was around. <laughs> this is like late 90s, you said, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's almost. It's in the early 90s early at this 90s. point. Okay. Yeah. It's so close. Plus, they didn't have us to let them know that they need to get evidence everywhere. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> That's obvious. <laughs> The home would always be robbed of valuables, and the murder weapon would be left at the scene. After committing two murders in Germany, Andre travels to Amsterdam to be closer to his sister, Helena. On the evening of September 27, 1990, he breaks into 56-year-old Maria W.'s home and beats her to death with a 12-pound cobblestone. Andre removes the victim's clothes and violates her corpse. He steals a camera, a watch, and some cash. In the kitchen, he found a bottle of Slivovica, a plum brandy, and drank it before fleeing the scene. Later in court, one of the witnesses would testify that this is one of Andre's favorite drinks. Yeah, I'm really into plum brandy. (laughs) I don't know if you uh, have it here, but... It's kind of my drink. I feel like it's a douchey thing to drink. Plum brandy. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. The day after this murder, Andre relocates again to Bratislava. Once he arrives at his destination, Andre begins the next leg of his murder tour at a retirement home on October 6, 1990. He murders 88-year-old Terezia R., while she is asleep in her retirement home bed. This time, Andre did not bring a weapon and only used his fists. It is unclear if he did this on purpose or was simply unable to find a suitable weapon. The retirement home staff reported that prayer books, a rosary, and some cash was missing from her room. You know, the security guards were missing that night, too. (laughs) Seriously, you have a whole staff, wouldn't you? Walked right in. Walked right in and killed an old lady. Or old. Yeah, he would come in through windows and stuff. But, like, wouldn't you hear that and everything? Plus, this dude stole prayer books and a rosary. What the fuck? Yeah. I'm not a religious person, but I still think that's fucked up. I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Gotta have standards. Jesus. Steal the puddings. Right? (laughs) All the pudding (laughs) cups. Y'all got (laughs) jello. Underneath Terezia's balcony, the police found some coins and cigarette butts. In the early morning of January 3rd, 1991, Andre went looking for another home to break into. 
He entered through an open window, but once inside, he realized he was only in a storage room that was locked from the outside. (laughs) Burn. Idiot. (laughs) He crept back out of the storage room and found another open window in the neighborhood. Upon entering, he realized that there were two people in the bedroom, 40-year-old Anna and her 16-year-old son, Jiraj. They were in town for a few days to celebrate the new year and were staying together in one room. Upon discovering two people instead of one, Andre decided to attack the 16-year-old Jiraj first. There was evidence that his mother, Anna, had tried to protect her son, but both victims were beaten to death with a large wooden stick. Andre then proceeded to rape Anna's body before leaving through the open window. Six days later, Andre breaks into the home of Jana B, carrying the long wooden handle of a gardening hoe as his weapon. He hits Jana over the head twice while she is sleeping, but the handle breaks in half during the second blow. The stunned woman wakes up and quickly realizes what is happening, then grabs the second wooden piece and starts fighting back. Yes. Exactly. Jana recalls, I was woken up by a hit to the head, and I saw a man standing by my bed. At first I thought I'm dreaming because I was living alone, but when I received another hit on the head, I woke up. The wooden shaft from a hoe Rigo stole outside on the building's yard broke because it was moldy. As Andre retreated towards her bedroom door, he unlocked it from the inside, and she threw a chair at him. I love this lady. Yeah, and she slept through the first hit. Right. She was like, I wasn't awake till the second one. Like, what? Yeah, this lady is badass. Jana followed him into the kitchen where he wrestled her onto a hot gas oven. She recalls beginning to feel a burn as he pushed her onto the oven. Then they fell to the ground and began wrestling. Andre began punching her in the head. So she grabbed his genitals and squeezed them as hard as she could. Oh, yep. Fuck yeah. Pop them. Get it, Jana. Yep. The groin injury slowed him down considerably, and he began to retreat. As he started walking away from her, she frantically pounded on the wall to alert her neighbors and screamed for them to call the police. A neighbor arrived to find Jana in shock and severely injured. I know we've talked about this before, but... Really going for the nuts. Is, Real, every it fucking seriously time. works. Yes. Major self-defense recommendation. Nuts. Always nut punch, nut grab. Pop them like grapes. Yes. Pretend you're making wine. <laughs> <laughs> Jana sought medical attention and filed a police report. There was light shining through the window the night of the attack, so she was able to give a detailed description of her attacker, as well as information about his clothing. She had noticed that Rigo's light blue pants were hand-sewn in the crotch area, which provided a distinct characteristic that could help identify the killer. I had written here, like Cinderella's glass slipper, (laughs) but for murderous pieces of shit. (laughs) But we already made a Cinderella joke, so I'm going to take that out. Ah, you thought of it first. (laughs) (laughs) Great minds, that's what I'm saying. Andre would not be caught for another year. But Jana said she did not want to move. Fuck that, I would leave. There's no way. If I knew that a guy that tried to kill me was still out there, I could not stay in my house. Yeah. No way. I want to be like, oh, I'm a badass. I could do it. There's no fucking way. I'll get a dog. Right? (laughs) Her family feared for her safety and encouraged her to relocate, but she refused. Jana feels she is not traumatized by the attack, saying... Andre Rigo is not interesting to me. I have no trauma from him. I don't feel anything. He doesn't mean anything to me. Okay, she's showing off or just lying. (laughs) (laughs) She said, I don't want to talk about him, read about him, or know anything about him. Neighbors and family say that she did, however, get a dog and begin sleeping with the lights on. I'm going to get a saltwater crocodile. What? (laughs) (laughs) If anyone comes in my house, you know. 
Yeah, totally. Okay, cool. It it does make sense to me. <laughs> it's a little nuts, but it totally makes <laughs> we sense. You get a mo. Nobody and fucks then... with a crocodile. No, uh-uh. absolutely not. Yeah. And a lot of times they're just really still, and you don't even notice. You don't even that know it's there. A cro- yeah. And then until you're too close. Yeah. And it's snap. too late. We can get a moat and get like ten of them, <laughs> and then have a party. <laughs> How are we going to even get out of the house, though? We don't need. Are to. they going to be friendly with us? Just... You can't tame a crocodile. It's a wild beast. Steve Irwin did. <laughs> 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 we could do it. <laughs> Three weeks later. Andre struck again on the same street. He removed the screen from a window and killed 79-year-old Helena N. with a piece of concrete. There's a lot of Helenas in this story. This is like the third one. One's his sister, but still. It's crazy that he went on the same street, so her being afraid with the lights on and I think it's totally like rational. Like he is he's right there. He didn't even go down like he that I would be scared. I'd be fucking scared if I heard. Terrifying. Then on July 14, 1991, 22-year-old Henrietta O. was attacked after leaving her window open to let cool air in on a warm summer night. Henrietta's grandmother was sleeping in another room of the residence, but was almost deaf and didn't hear anything. Rigo smashed Henrietta's head, raped her, robbed her, and left her for dead. Henrietta survived for 18 days, but eventually died of the injuries she sustained during the attack. No, and she was like, oh, okay, like outside. I thought no one checked on her for 18 days and she's just there. Oh, no. Okay, thank God. Sorry. (laughs) No, that's that's like my worst nightmare. Yeah, that no one gets me and I'm just on the floor listening to fucking shit go on outside. I know. That's terrible. Yeah, no, they discovered her and and, and took then, her. They tried to save her. Oh, it just didn't work. I know. And especially her poor grandmother yeah. knowing that she was just in the next room. Yeah. So sad. On March 4th, 1992, Andre went on a date to the movies with his girlfriend. After the movie, his girlfriend believed that the pair were going to return home together. But While they were walking home, Andre suddenly announced that he needed to take care of something. He quickly hopped on a trolley and left his girlfriend alone in the street. He popped a necro boner and bounced. Right? (laughs) I gotta go take care of something. I'd be so pissed. You know what sucks is that, um, I mean, I'm assuming he's having sex with her. She's like Eskimo sisters with like three dead girls. I know. <laughs> That's not okay. Yeah. That sucks. Mm-mm. Ugh. Sloppy seconds with some corpses. It's like that whole let me smell your dick thing. But then when you smell it, you're like, <laughs> That's not what I was. Dick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I thought it was going to smell like fish, but it smells like dead person. Yep. Ugh. Oh, God. Eskimo sisters. Now I'm really hungry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she went home alone and waited up for a while but andre didn't return home at all that night instead he broke into the home of 67 year old matilda Yu and murdered her in the same way as his previous victims with this murder detectives from various counties where he committed his crimes finally started working together within hours of matilda's murder Police had identified Andre as the killer and were on the hunt for him. Fortunately, police were able to easily find him at work in the heating department of the Carlton Hotel. He was finally taken into custody on March 4, 1992. When he was apprehended, he was not wearing socks because he had left them at the crime scene the previous night. The police knew that the killer put his socks on his hands to avoid leaving fingerprints. So this was important in confirming that they had the right man. An officer present during the arrest said, He was still in a trance like a snake who just swallowed its prey. There were traces of blood on his shoes and trousers. Inside his locker at work, there were jewels belonging to the victim. I really don't use the word trousers or jewels enough. (laughs) I'm going to bring those back. Or snake. Snake and trousers. (laughs) Put it all together. Yeah. In fact, at the time of the arrest, Andre still had blood on him. When questioned about the blood during his interrogation, he claimed that he had spilled pancake syrup on himself. 
the detectives. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it was a breakfast accident. You know. <laughs> The detectives informed him that his semen was found in multiple victims. So Andre made up an elaborate story about a sex worker at a strip club who planted his DNA at the scene as a revenge for a dispute they had. Makes total sense. That's what strippers do with their free time. Right? (laughs) They'll pump and dump. (laughs) (laughs) Pump it from him and dump it in a (laughs) desk. Oh, man. You're just trying to incorporate our new favorite phrase, (laughs) pump and dump, into this episode. My favorite. (laughs) Police also questioned him about his footprints and cigarette butts with his DNA that were found outside the homes of the victims. Andre claimed it was purely coincidence that he had been in the area of the murders and that he had often went to pee in the bushes of people's yards. He said sometimes he got curious and would look in windows, but never went inside. So he's saying his footprints are there because he's just like peeing next to someone's window all the time. Like, you're right outside the window, dude. Yeah, and sometimes I look in. (laughs) Just sometimes. It's cool. It's real chill. Boys couldn't go inside. I didn't (laughs) kill anyone. I just walked really close. I hate when murderers do that. Just like, I mean, yeah, I was there, but I didn't murder them. Like, what the fuck is that? You just put yourself. (laughs) (laughs) That's just so crazy. Who thinks that works? That's so weird. Definitely not every lawyer ever. (laughs) (laughs) Andre also claimed that the jewelry in his locker was all gifted to him by various women. And he said that women often gave him gifts. Strippers. Right? (laughs) Always with the gifts. Strippers are really known for their generosity. They really are. Yeah. (laughs) Charity work. (laughs) Officers conducted a search of his home and found light blue pants that were hand sewn in the crotch area. These were the same exact pants that the survivor, Jana B., said her attacker was wearing during her assault. Police also recovered jewelry that Andre had given to his 12-year-old daughter, which was identified as belonging to various victims. That's fucked up. That's awful. Andre Rigo has never expressed remorse for his actions and pled not guilty despite mountains of evidence against him. The file for his court proceedings was over 5,500 pages long. There was DNA evidence from Andre's blood and semen at every crime scene as well as testimonies from 194 witnesses, including witnesses who traveled from Germany and the Netherlands to testify. Andre's one surviving victim, Jana, attended the trial as well. She wore a wig and attempted to disguise herself. When details of his crimes were recounted during trial, Andre did not react in any way. He was sitting rigidly and leaning a bit forward, his face showing no emotion throughout the trial. According to the court-appointed psychologist Anton Heretic, Andre Rigo was diagnosed as a psychopath. The diagnostic profile found Andre to not be a sadist or have sadosexual tendencies. The psychologist said, he does not accept any social norms. He is lacking empathy and behaves very impulsively. At the same time, he is a schizoid personality, unable to create relationships with others. He has strange thoughts and hobbies. He is a loner. He is a combination of schizoid and antisocial psychopath, creating a very dangerous type of criminal. Andre's psychological profile said that the strangeness of being away from home, lack of hospitality, and the language barrier in a foreign country could have influenced his homicidal behavior. Or you're just a murderer, and you're yeah. just going to murder, no matter what that combination is. Uh, if you're not a murderer, you don't resort to murder. Yeah, that's true. Am I being judgy? Yeah, I think you're being judgy. But it's okay. <laughs> I think people are made and born a murderer, right? No, I no. know. But if you just don't have it in you, like, it's not because you couldn't It's not going to be language. the circumstance of, like, going to another country. Yeah, you know? no hospitality and no, I couldn't talk yeah. to anyone. I've been to plenty of countries where people are dicks. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> 
I've been to like Beverly Hills. Right. And I I've been down like the street. Shit. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. There's no excuse. After a 10-day-long trial, Andre Rigo was sentenced to life in prison in December 1994. Woo! He was ordered to be imprisoned in the third class, which means the highest security prison in Slovakia. The judge explained that the reasoning for the sentence was the brutality of the murders and the low probability that Andre Rigo would be able to reform and re-socialize. Prison staff say that Andre behaves normally most of the time, but has a tendency to react too aggressively. Correction officers find it difficult to communicate with Andre because he rarely says a coherent sentence. A prison representative said chances for his correction are zero. After the trial, Andre appealed the first order court sentence. In this appeal, he maintains his innocence without giving any kind of proof or evidence to back up his claim. Again, how do you expect that to work? Like, I'm innocent. It's cool, guys. Pinky promise. (laughs) (laughs) The Court of Appeals confirmed the guilty verdict in February 1996, and he will be unable to make any further appeals. But here's the thing. Andre Rigo will be eligible to apply for parole in 2019. Oh, shit. That is so soon. Jesus Christ. For killing a lot of women. A lot of people. Jesus. Oh, man. I know. Should we write a letter? (laughs) (laughs) I don't speak Czech or... I don't speak Czech, so I don't. Sp- I don't speak anything really. I barely speak English. Let's draw pictures. <laughs> <laughs> just like a heavy cobblestone and a dude with a boner. Yeah, <laughs> and just but- like bars in front of him. Necro boner. We could have a big arrow. <laughs> no, no, like a big no thing through the right? necro boner. Circle slash necro boner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is so nuts to me that he's going to be out so soon. That's only, you know, 25 years ish until he's up for parole. Like, that's such a short sentence. You yeah. killed nine people. That's short for one person. Right? Like, that's nuts. So, if you do your murder and do it in Slovakia, right? <laughs> now you know where to go on your murder vacation. <laughs> cool. That's it for necrophilia. Next. That was a lot of fucking. That was a lot a of fucking. A lot of fucking. A lot of dead people. Yeah. Yeah. So next week, we'll move on because I can't handle any more necro boners. No? Okay. I'm done with that. (laughs) Cool. I'm done. Yeah, it it was good. It was fun. Fun while it lasted. Not really. But then it's time (laughs) to go. (laughs) So thank you guys for listening to another episode. If you haven't already followed us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, go ahead and head over there and do that. Please leave us a review if you haven't on iTunes and make sure you hit the subscribe button. If you need more information or want to read up on the stories that we went through today, I put the links for all my research materials in the show notes, as well as victims resources. If you need any websites or suicide hotlines, domestic violence, child protective services, I am putting those in the notes. So just click on those and it'll take you to those pages. We wanted to say thank you again to Layla, Kim, and Darby for supporting us on Patreon. The link for our Patreon is also in the description for this episode. And I think we'll skip because it's a little bit late. We're going to do our iTunes reviews next time. Okay. Cool. cool. Yeah, you want to go? I know it's your favorite time. It is my favorite time, but we we're going to put it off and it's going to be doubly good next time. Yeah. I we, promise. We could just cuddle now we after, could just after cuddle. we fuck after we do the death box we can go cuddles let's go play spoon i want to be big spoon oh that's perfect i'm always little spoon <laughs> you notice know perfect <laughs> thanks again for listening yeah, thank bye. you bye and now a thought from geico motorcycle it took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online please be the cheetah please be the cheetah and learn your animal isn't the cheetah but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to GEICO. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance.